Um, so I want to talk about VR, and you know, I think as Lee alluded to, um, talk about the future, but unfortunately when you're talking about VR, the future is often as much now as it is going to be um, next month, next year, in the next five years. Um, and as you'll see, some of the examples I have in my slides are from within the last two weeks, within the last week. These are things that are moving so quickly that we have to use examples that are very current. So any conversation about VR from my perspective has to start with home renovation, of course. Um, if you've ever done any home renovation, you know that this is not a legitimate picture of what home renovation looks like. It's much more along the lines of this, oh, dear God, what have we done? And Lowe's came to us um, about three years ago and they said, we're missing about $4 billion a year in potential revenues from people who are too scared to get into the home renovation process. What can we do about that? How can we fix that problem? So we went through this process, we knew it with our clients, and we looked at a lot of these different potential futures, and one of the ways we thought to solve the problem was using virtual reality. What if you could visualize the changes that you'd be making in your house before you actually spent the money? We're gonna remove that barrier of fear. Now the thing was, two or three years ago, actually three or four years ago now, there was no Oculus Rift. Uh, it hadn't even really entered the Kickstarter phase yet, and we were building on a lot of thoughts about where this could go. Um, we ended up building um, a hollow, what we called the hollow room, the Lowe's hollow room, and allowed a consumer to visualize the changes they would make in their home using Lowe's products that were on the shelf and be able to walk through your virtual bathroom so that you could see what you would be affecting. Uh, we ended up building a fairly large structure. That was this. This was placed in Lowe's stores. And then as uh, the technology started to advance, while we were in the project, we ended up porting that experience from the large physical footprint into the head-mounted display of an Oculus, and that's what we showed at CES. We ended up winning some awards at Augmented World Expo. We won the best enterprise solution. Um, we were a top tech finalist at CES. Through this process, we became very bullish about VR. We were able to see firsthand all the potential, especially from a brand perspective. It became very exciting. The thing was that we're dealing with a lot of existing bias about VR as a concept. It's an old concept. We can go back to the early 90s when we had Lawnmower Man with Sexy VR with Pierce Brosnan and Jeff Fahey. And then we had Sexy VR with Michael Douglas and Demi Moore. And then we had Sexy VR with Angela Lansbury wearing a smart maroon vest. So we had this peak of expectations, inflated expectations in the early 90s. What happened was that sort of affected the way we perceive VR and uh, the way now we talk about VR, but it's a new opportunity now. And the reason it's a new opportunity now is because of the technology that is driving VR as an experience. So when you look at VR as a potential experience, there's some fundamental technical questions that need to be solved, and they're things like the need for exceptional resolution, uh, extremely quick refresh rates, low latency, millimeter accuracy of positional tracking, responses to action, expansive field, field of view. These are things that are now uh, possible now, maybe weren't possible just a few short years ago. And if you're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, which I absolutely adore because it's this brilliant mashup of sort of poetry and, and strategy, um, you can see that virtual reality is going through now what they would call the slope of enlightenment. Um, and there was the peak of inflated expectations maybe uh, 15, 20 years ago, but now we're seeing all the te technology allow the potential for VR to actually make a difference, especially from a brand perspective. These headsets, head-mounted displays, HMDs, are the manifestation of all this technology, and there's no shortage of HMDs. Uh, Oculus is clearly uh, the most notable one, has the most, uh, has the most um, uh, cachet. We also have things popping up very quickly, though, like the HTC Vive, the Fove, um, Sony's uh, Project Morpheus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a problem, though. And there's a problem with the way in which you experience VR. And one of those problems is this big fat cable that sticks out of the back of your head. If we're trying to imagine a different reality that you're supposed to accept as an, a reality, you can't be tethered by this big cable that's sticking out of the back of your head. And Palmer Luckey, who's, the, uh, who's ostensibly the inventor of the Oculus Rift, um, 
just a little bit over a week ago, came out and said that cables are going to be the major obstacle in the industry for a long time. Uh, mobile VR is going to be successful long before PC VR goes wireless. Now the other obstacle for a lot of these is price. So, you know, the average price for these is probably about $350, $400. But that doesn't even matter because you can't even get them yet. So from a consumer perspective, or for trying to maximize reach, these may be difficult to achieve. Now the one outlier on this list is the device from Samsung, because that is available. And in fact, they've just announced that the new version, um, I believe, is going to be ready by Christmas. HMDs are going to be the future because of the vividness that they can deliver. At the moment, mobile presents the greatest opportunity for brands to start experimenting with VR. There was a great foundational paper uh, written in 1993 that talked about the way in which people experience VR as opposed to the way in which technology guides the VR experience. And one of the foundations that uh, was talked about was the notion of vividness. So that there has to be this richness in the environment so that uh, the senses are fooled and this reality can be accepted. The vividness can be provided by a mobile device. And in fact, if you were to look at the earlier versions of the Oculus, when they tore out the insides, you literally found a mobile device as the screen inside the headset. So break it all out, tear it out. There was literally a Samsung Galaxy Note 3 sitting in the headset. So mobile has the potential, especially when we consider how marvelous all our mobile devices are, to really drive these amazing experiences. If mobile can do that, then something as simple and as analog as cardboard can provide the foundation for some great VR experiences. And in fact, just a couple days ago, uh, just by a show of hands, does anybody get this in, in, as their newspaper? Does anybody still cling to the, uh, to the newspaper world? Um, so uh, my parents got it. I drove over there real quickly, got there before they could pick up the paper, tore it out of their paper, and then had to explain to them what it was I was doing. Uh, that backfired a little bit. Um, and as you guys will uh, see in a few minutes, sponsored by many, sponsored by GE, um, but this is now putting VR into people's hands in a real way. That was just a million right off the bat. There have already been millions distributed. Um, who knows what the uh, footprint is now. Experimenting with Google Cardboard takes advantage of some really great attributes. The extraordinarily low cost, the easy access, the opportunity for brandability, the fact that you can brand the headset for pennies is marvelous. And then of course it's technologies that consumers already own. But when we talk about what you create for VR, we have to think about the approach. And uh, this is a picture of Jaron Lanier um, from, from decades ago, who was one of the pioneers of how we consider VR today. And he said that to be joyous and beautiful in the application of VR, you have to make the individual the power center rather than the remote company. So what does this mean? If you've used VR, you know that it can be an isolating experience. There's an intimacy. There's a vulnerability. It is a different reality, which means you must step outside of your existing reality. That is a very um, difficult balance to strike for brands, which are used to saying, here is my message. And this is even more dramatic than what we've dealt with with social. This is not just this sort of you know, light, you know, being gentle with about how to push the message. This is a dramatic difference because of the sensory difference of VR. If you think about the way in which, quite literally, the camera is established in a VR experience, the brand cannot put the consumer in a headlock and tell them to look in a certain direction. This is an immersive environment. So we have to find this way of creating these balanced perspectives in which the brand can push the, the, their message, their agenda, but also allow for the, the specific qualities of a, of a very high fidelity VR experience from a consumer perspective. And I think the brand must share the stage. It's got to strike this balance where the brand is able to establish its messaging, establish its voice, but allow the consumer to move freely, both, both literally and figuratively. And I think that's why, um, not saying we did this intentionally, we found success with what we did for Lowe's. Because while we were providing the Lowe's experience, there was a freedom for the consumer to establish their own story. 
they were able to express themselves and freely move and create their own universe. Now, I also need to establish that VR is not video. And uh, Chris Milk, uh, who runs a company called Verse, which is doing a lot of exciting things with VR storytelling, says it very plainly that the mistake that every new medium makes is trying to take what the old medium was. Books on the radio, at the beginning of cinema they shot plays. In order for this new form of storytelling to evolve, we've got to create a new canvas. Oculus is doing some very interesting things with the way that they tell stories. Not only are they creating the platform, they've realized that in order to figure out how to tell stories most effectively, they need to tell their own stories. So they've created something called Story Studio. This is a still from a film they made called Henry. And they've established some basic tenets of what they say are the most effective ways of telling a story in a VR environment. I think collectively, for me, what these all mean, to paraphrase, is that it's important to take your time when telling a VR story. You've got to allow that story to evolve because the way in which the consumer controls that camera, the way the consumer controls that experience, but not too much time. Uh, people who are uh, actively engaged in making these VR experiences are dealing with some very real constraints, um, one of which is the physical barrier. Uh, if you've worn VR, especially some of the older versions, but this is getting fixed in newer versions, you've probably felt a little bit nauseous. Um, some of the technology is taking care of that. But you have to imagine that if you are adopting a new reality, different than the one you own, you might feel a little bit queasy. Uh, there's also the isolation. So we are now attuned to being creatures of multi-screens, um, active you know, engagement in multiple activities. This demands all of your senses be focused on one thing at one time. That creates a lot of stress for the viewer. It's important to realize, though, that vividness is not, of course, the only foundational uh, aspect of VR, and that interactivity is really the balance that must be, must be strike. So when you look at cardboard, cardboard provides the vividness pretty well, um, but it's not as good with what we would say from an interactive standpoint. You're able to look around, but it's not necessarily giving you the opportunity to control your environment. And so where we see a lot of VR going is the ability to control your environment. This is what we would refer to in the 90s as the goggles and gloves. So not only can I see, I can affect, I can touch, I can move around. Uh, this is the um, uh, one version for the Oculus, uh, HTC uh, Vive, Vive, never get that right, um, is developing its own system. The question becomes, if it's hard to create a new reality, it's because our existing reality is already such high fidelity. So our brain is exceptionally good at taking all of these various signals we have from our lives, the sensory signals, the motor signals, sense of pri proprioception, which is the ability to know where your hands are in space and be able to, to sort of navigate your environment. It takes all of these different things. Creating a new environment on top of that is extraordinarily hard. There are some new companies such as Magic Leap, that are trying to reduce the stress between creating that entirely new environment and creating a potential environment on, on top of our existing world. Let's talk about that a little bit, because I know that sounds pretty weird. So we look at the future of VR as being part of an ecosystem of mixed reality. So that VR is not going to go away, um, but it's not going to be the all-encompassing vehicle for mixed reality uh, experiences in the future. And the best way to describe mixed reality that I've heard is simply looking at the difference of virtual, virtual reality feeling like you are somewhere else. The ability to put on that headset and be transported to another location. The difference is that with mixed reality, the virtual content feels like it's there. How do you do that? You've probably heard of HoloLens from Microsoft. Um, these are very early stage technologies but the concept behind them is sound. So if my brain is going to tether me to this real world, what is the easiest way for me to feel like I am seeing some virtual content or in a virtual environment? And that's by giving me a sensory overlay that relies on my visual cortex rather than trying to take over the rest of my motor sensory experience. If you're not familiar with uh, HoloLens, 
this, for example, is the type of experience you may have in the future. Right now, there's some limitations with the way the hardware works. But you will be able to see digital content projected onto a physical environment. Your visual cortex is so strong that you believe the validity of that experience. Um, about a week ago, I think, um, Magic Leap uh, pushed a new patent filing out. And this was part of their patent filing where they explained what the Magic Leap hardware experience probably looks like. And without getting too much detail, it's basically an oscillating fiber optic projector bouncing off a series of mirrors in a headset. I'm really excited. We haven't actually seen it yet. But what you may have also not seen uh, last week was this really exciting video where they have actually, um, maybe working? OK. Where they have actually recorded what it looks like to look through their hardware and software. And so imagine that you are wearing a headset, and you're in your environment, and you are looking and able to see these virtual artifacts floating in your world. This is very exciting. Um, now, to temper the excitement, probably five to 10 years away. But when we look at this from an opportunity perspective, we think it's really important that brands start experimenting now. Um, this is a very wide territory of things, and, and we'll talk more about the application of this in a real world in just a second um, with, with Mini. But you know, I think to sum up, virtual reality is a new opportunity. We have to look at it as something that is happening now. Um, there's a lot of mobile potential. Uh, it's a balance of these competing priorities of how do you structure the consumer experience, but also make sure that you're telling a great brand story. Um, it's something that we have to create a new lexicon for. It's something we have to create new behaviors for. It's something we have to create a new foundation for because it is not video. Um, and then most importantly, it's rapidly evolving. Um, this is an area in which if you have not yet used VR, I highly, highly, highly recommend, at the very least, you go get a cardboard. You know, you go get one of the new Samsung devices and you at least start to play with it to familiarize yourself with where this is going. Thank you very much.